All right. So, hey guys, I am Bethany Quinn, and this is Quintersectional Conversations, and I am here with Stacy Bow, who is a friend who uh, does cultural preservation work um, for uh, an institution here in DC, mm -hmm. um, but works with people all around the world. So, anyway, we're going to chat with her and catch up because I haven't seen her in a while, and she's know. Really I know, man. Um, but how's Philly? How's the weather up there? Actually, finally, it's um, gotten really nice. Um, I'm actually wearing a t-shirt where I can tell you that literally a week ago, I was wearing fleece pajamas. Um, and when my, uh, so my dad bought a new house um, and we were moving him last weekend, there were flurries coming out of the sky. <laughs> right now, it's like mm -hmm. almost 90 degrees here right now. And that sounds Yes. Of course. <laughs> of course, last week it was terrible. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. That's also not what you want on moving day. No, 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 no. But, um, so yeah, but, but yeah, Philly's good. Um, yeah, like my childhood home, uh, is kind of out in the boonies a little bit, and I can't tell if I am too seasoned to the city life because I keep encountering, uh, wildlife such as deer and groundhogs and. <laughs> You're like, you know, like, whoa, like, whoa. And then I even caught, um, while I was working from our dining room table, I saw a fox run right across the front yard. So, yeah, I I've heard that wildlife is getting like much more, um, assertive all around yeah. the world. Humans are just like not really around as much. Mm -hmm. Or we're, we're keeping to our, ourselves a lot more. So they're feeling a little bit more brazen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, so I actually don't know, how did you get started in your career? Like, how did you get to uh, work where you're working? Uh, that is a great question. Um, so my... Actually, why don't you say a little bit more, just give the top line of what you do. Right sure. Now. Okay. So currently, <laughs> I, uh, I do training for cultural heritage professionals, which is the blanket term for anyone who um, is in charge of maintaining a cultural collection, whether that be a museum, an archive. Sorry, my phone is reminding me that we have this date right now. <laughs> have a date. Yay. Yay. Um, so yeah, museums, archives, libraries, um, but you know, heritage is very, you know, a broad term. So we've worked with performing arts specialists, uh, Native American communities, um, I'm trying to think other art centers, basically, you know, the people around the country and the world who are trying to make, you know, save stuff <laughs> in the most respectful uh, use of that term. So, um, so yes, uh, my background is in archeology span um, and that was what my undergrad degree was in. Uh, and yes, I do love Indiana Jones. He's a terrible, terrible archeologist. <laughs> but it is probably one of the reasons why I got into the field, let's be honest. Um, so yeah, so I studied archeology span and then I got a, um, an internship with a museum down in Washington, DC, because I, at, like most people my age, um, I was full of subject matter expertise, but no actual professional skills. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, humanities education, right? Oh life. yeah, good uh, interdisciplinary education. I could write a damn good essay, but did I know how to send an email? No. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I did the uh, same thing. I didn't know how to send an invoice. I didn't know that was a thing I was supposed to do. Exactly. When people were using the terms like accounts payable and accounts receivable, I would just like go, uh-huh. <laughs> oh, so dumb. So dumb. <laughs> And God bless the people that I worked with at that first museum, because like I really, to this day, I have so much respect and and um, reverence for them because yeah. they definitely were like, okay, sweetheart, we get that you love working with this stuff, but you're gonna have to kind of come up with some some actual skills. <laughs> um, yeah, like 
or okay i knew how to write an email but like i wouldn't know how to write like a work email it would be very chatty you know and be like hi my name is Stacy, um and i <laughs> anyway um, I like, I like, actually, I feel like the hair flip should be an emoji and it's not. It should. <laughs> <laughs> it should totally be uh, an emoji. We should write Facebook about that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Totally. I want like Valley Girl mm -hmm. um, emotions just to like reassert that, you know, mm -hmm. stereotypically female. Oh, 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you yeah. got a job at that first museum. That's I got, yep. And I was in the conservation department, which is uh, traditionally the department in a museum that, you know, takes care of the stuff. Um, you know, similar to how I use a lot of medical um, metaphors or associations when I describe my work, you know, the conservation lab is where, you know, objects in a collection get assessed for their health you know they're given their um prescribed treatments literally like you you treat an object in a conservation lab um and you know the people that i worked with were the doctors making sure that these priceless um pieces of heritage you know were going to be around forever and ever and ever um, so I loved working there, but I also realized that in order be to become a conservator, again, very similar to a surgeon, you have to have impeccable um, hand skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another reason why you're cooking and I'm not. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to mention, I'm making um, jalapeno simple syrup. And quick question about that as we sidetrack. Yeah. What does one use jalapeno simple syrup a for? really, really good margarita my favorite margarita. Oh. Yeah, so Taqueria del Barrio, which if you don't know them, you should go there immediately. They're in Petworth. They're amazing. Okay. Um, I miss them, mostly because the staff is so fantastic, which is like in quarantine, there's like only so much, but like, mm. um, but no, they have, I really like their margarita, and then they do a spicy margarita, mm -hmm. um, and mm. it is delicious, and the people are lovely. And Excellent. And All good things. And they have also important uh chicken mole nachos on mm -hmm. happy hour. so <sighs> sigh one day my friend we shall go there <laughs> we shall go there we shall overcome um yeah. yes so anyway so you were saying um but yes yeah, so you have to have impeccable hand skills um and i realized i i i don't <laughs> Um, so then I really got to thinking, you know, brainstorming, like, okay, I love this field. I'm not really cut out for one specific aspect of it. How can I, um, keep supporting this field? And the other thing I realized is that I also didn't want to just become a, like a, cause a lot of archeologists, they become professors. And though I yeah. love my professor archeologist friends at that time, I was not really, um, thrilled at the idea of like becoming a professor. So um, it took me a while to really like kind of brainstorm um, about what I would want to do with my fabulous archeology span skills. So um, after working at that museum for about five years, I finally took the plunge for grad school um, back in 2012. Um, I forget Bethany, had we already met by then or no? Oof. Quizzing me on people when I met people at a I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it just I, dawned on me. I can't remember if I met you before no, grad school or not. Probably not, probably okay. not, because I think, um, but it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. I bought my condo in 2012, so. Okay, no, I don't. Okay, then we hadn't met yet. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Um, anyway, so. anyway. So I went to grad school for, um, and I actually went to grad school in London because Europe manages its um, heritage in a, in a different way. Um, and I don't know if your people would like to hear the differences. Absolutely, between. Sure. this is, this is <laughs> you wanna learn all the things. Okay, um, but uh, I'm like, in, like, I can actually feel my, my cheeks get warm. I, <laughs> <laughs> I know you I know you run with a geeky crowd and I love running with that geeky crowd too, but I still feel really embarrassed that people are like listening to me talk about this. <laughs> it's all good. It is all good. 
They're not right now. They will they will later when we post it, right? Okay. <laughs> um but yeah, so so Europe how can I boil this down? The nature of heritage management has definitely come out of like shockingly um colonialism. So where was the heart of that? Europe. Um, and because of that, they have, like, Europe really is a um, center for, like, modern heritage management. And it comes with both all the weaknesses and strengths that that comes with, you know, like, when we define what heritage is, you know, how, hmm, how communities preserve their heritage versus Eastern traditions versus Western traditions, um, all that good stuff. So I feel like Europe, or during my research, had kind of... Um, it had uh, a lot more dynamic uh, voices in, in heritage management than I thought that the U.S. did. Um, so I, and also, <laughs> fun fact, um, at least from an um, archaeological perspective, doing your graduate work in, in, in England is actually uh, cheaper, in my case, than it was to do a master's in the U.S. So That's good to know. Oh, actually, that's very good to know. Mm -hmm. How yeah. much cheaper? How much did it cost? Uh, I, when I sat down with it, well, the other thing is, is that depending on the masters that you want to do, most masters in England are just one year. And even though it equaled to about a year of graduate school in the U.S., masters in the U.S. are always two years, right? Right. Or right. at least two years. Yeah. So yeah. just by... <laughs> How else can they get you all and take all of your money and... I know. ...indebted. Until incredible. Now. Absolutely <laughs> incredible. So just by that sheer fact alone, saying like, okay, if I can get a master's in a year and pay the same amount, rather than just, you know, rather than paying double that amount, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to England. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I got my heritage management um, master's in uh, at UCL, University College London. Okay. Um, fantastic time. Um, had some great experiences, traveled a lot. And then I did my post um, master's uh, placement, which is part of the whole master's program. Like, you know, they wanted to give you some job experience, which was very much appreciated. Um, I did that uh, at the UNESCO offices in Bangkok, Thailand, um, of all places. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. Uh, again, learned a lot about political science while I was there because again, um, at least in my undergraduate days, uh, and I love my undergraduate, don't get me wrong. I mean, it really was very cut and dry subject matter. They rarely talked about the bigger issues. And in, I feel like today's society, I think anybody would agree with me, like, you know, the idea of heritage and identity politics and nationalism aren't just in the, you know, archeological and history sphere anymore. You have to have this like, you know, wide ranging understanding of big issues. So, um, so yeah, learned a lot about that uh, while I was at UNESCO. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Ooh, what are, what, oh, sorry, what else so I need to make the rest of the gnocchi too, cause I, uh, I started it earlier and then it, I, I thought I was going to be able to get through it earlier because I made, mm -hmm. uh, I made ricotta and then I made, I'm making ricotta gnocchi. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I realized that um, it, it was one of those things where it was like, after you, after you kind of make the dough, it's like, put it in the refrigerator for 15 minutes, like take it out, like see how it is. If it's not mm -hmm. great, like put it back in the refrigerator and da, 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 da. And I was like, it doesn't really work with the show. Like there's yeah. a, it's always kind of a trade-off. But anyway, so now I am making um, the rest of the gnocchi and I'm debating how I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do some kind of a like lemon sauce or something. So. Ooh. And am I correct in remembering how gnocchi is made? You boil it rather than like... So I made ricotta gnocchi. Um, so I'm, uh, I made the ricotta. Ricotta is super simple to make. You basically mm -hmm. just... Um, you basically just... Uh, mm -hmm boil or almost not quite boil but like get it to the point of boiling where it's like foamy and stuff mm, like um, uh full fat milk yeah i did full fat um yeah. i don't think uh. you have to but i think it's encouraged mm. um and then you add lemon juice and then strain it through cheesecloth and that's mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, and then you sort of um i use paper towels to kind of blot it down 
Mm -hmm. um, and then add some flour and salt and Parmesan and what was the other? Oh, an egg. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Side um, note, which we can talk about, I actually have cheesecloth with me and I can teach you how you can save things uh, using cheesecloth. <laughs> I would love to learn that. <laughs> so anyway, so you, um, so you were at, uh, you got your grad degree in England and then where'd you go from there? So yeah, and then I did my, my um, so work in placement in Thailand. Um, oh, and then I, that's what I was going to ask. So how was Thailand? Like, fantastic. <laughs> Um, what was the craziest night that you had while you were there? Ooh, good question. I studied abroad. I know how it is. <laughs> I know. Also, this is also getting recorded, so I should probably... <laughs> I know. <laughs> the craziest one, mine is a few. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what, what is the craziest one that I am comfortable talking about? Right. Um, because I actually, I turned 30 when I was over in, in nice. Bangkok. Um, and I mean, the, okay, I'll, I'll, I won't talk about like the, <laughs> the crazy side of it, but this is, this just goes to show you just like how awesome, you know, the city of Bangkok is. So like, it was my, so I got to, to Bangkok in January. I turned 30 in March and you know, I'm all, I'm just there all by myself. I, even though I had made like, you know, I was getting along with my colleagues, you know, I was, I was alone. Um, and even though there's a huge expat community in Bangkok, you know, I wasn't really making a lot of connections, but I had made like one or two friends through this local soccer pickup game that I had started playing with. Cool. And, um, and, you know, we were all still just getting to know each other. It was great, you know, exercise, fantastic. So then my birthday rolls around and I'm like too shy to like, because, you know, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was homesick. So I invited like one or two of my friends from the soccer team um, to like come have a drink with me on my birthday. And one of them at the very end dropped out because she was sick. And then the other one met me at the bar and I was feeling you know, quite like, like, all right, this is nice, but this is not really like, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the friend that I was sitting with at the bar was like secretly texting everybody on the soccer team that, you know, it's Stacy's 30th birthday. She's all by herself here in this bar. You guys should come out. And the whole soccer team. Oh, that's out. so nice. I'm, I still get choked up like thinking about it. I could not believe how, and you know, and it's made up of all different types, you know, uh, like Japanese, Thai, Chinese, European, Australians, you know, and like people I had only just seen, you know, from afar on the field, all of a sudden coming up to me being like, happy birthday. Oh, it was nice. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. Nice. So, um, and then you can tell me the rest of the story later. Yeah. And then that might be the last thing I kind of remember. <laughs> from <that night>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, uh, hopefully my, my story shows just like, it's just such a pl great place and I, everybody should just go to Bangkok. It's, it's just go. And what is, what is, um, mm -hmm. what was your favorite food when you were there? And what is a food that you can get there that you miss? Okay, so answer to the first question, mango sticky rice. Oh nice. my God. <laughs> um, because like it, um, you get it like out of a food truck there often. <laughs> um, so like you can literally almost like ice cream, they'll like give you like a styrofoam container of mango sticky rice. And of course there's like coconut cream. Um, Covered, oh, so good, so good. Very cool. Um, and is there a different food that you miss? Or is that the food that you miss? I miss that just because, um, just like any tropical area, I feel like the fruit over there is just so much more flavorful. And the like when you get mango sticky rice in Thai restaurants here, it's always the mango that is just kind of falls flat with me. It's either like not sweet enough, not juicy enough, can obviously was picked way before it was ripe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
You know, what's also funny is that while I was over there, I was introduced to coconut water. Mm -hmm. And before I'd never heard of coconut water as like a drink drink. Yeah. And you know, over there, they like just, you know, open up a coconut, give you a straw and you just, you know, and then you toss it away. And I was like, wow, like, look at me. Like, uh, <laughs> um, like, why hasn't this hit the States? And then literally like when I got back was when like the coconut water like exploded and it was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> I, uh, I had a bad experience with coconut water when I was living in Panama. Actually. Really? Yeah. I, um, I found out the hard way that, um, you should not, you should control and, and, only have a certain amount of it um, yes yes mm -hmm. because um yeah that's an issue <laughs> actually that's so funny uh, you mentioned I, that I i'm pretty like sure the, like mm -hmm. the jelly that you scoop out of it after you drink it yep. so i would drink the whole thing and then have that and yep. it's you should not do that um mm -hmm. not do that more than like one one or two of those so anyway it's so funny that you say that. I'm pretty sure people told me about that too. They were like, oh yeah, coconut water, it's great. But like, you know, you should, <laughs> don't go overboard with it. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> good, good for them for telling you that. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry you were not given that yet, PSA, and you had to find out the hard way. Anyway, um, so you were in Bangkok and then you came back. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and that was when, um, uh, oh, I should also mention, um, back when I was at my first museum, the, uh, the big earthquake in Haiti happened in 2010. Oh, shit, okay. And um, the museum that I was uh, working at um, was part of the large cultural recovery project that um, developed after that because, um, the the Haitian cultural community was reaching out to all of its you know networks saying you know we're getting to an extent we're getting excuse me we're getting food we're getting water you know all the NGOs are coming in and taking care of that but nobody's caring about our culture and that is what you know everybody is asking about they want to be able to go to their churches they want to be able to sing they want you know mural art is actually like a huge huge um trade and craft down in Haiti and you know artist studios have been collapsed um famous murals were like in in um high risk of full collapsing and nobody was really doing anything about it and the United States um launched a cultural recovery um project where it was sending you know either supplies or uh cultural professionals down to haiti to help the um community down there and they were salvaging bronze sculptures they were bringing trailers in to keep um paintings uh cool and out of the elements um and it was this watershed moment in the um cultural community and um, and even though I wasn't directly involved, I re like some of my colleagues were involved with it. And I remember back then going like, wow, this is, this is such great work. Like, wow. And then it was like, okay, what do I want to do with my life? And like, I didn't really kind of pay attention um, to uh, how the project had wrapped up, went to grad school, did my Thailand thing, came back to DC and was like job job hunting and that's when I met my now current boss um, who was hired to continue the work of the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project. Um, and she was like, this has been labeled as a success and we realized that there is a, there's gonna be a continued need for this because <laughs> disasters are not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and I would like to start a team that um, directly addresses this and is around like we're not you know and that way we can help quickly rather than going can we help can we help can we help <laughs> yeah Which, yeah um happened a lot after Haiti so um and that's where I've ended up um and I've been there for about five years now which is I can't believe that <laughs> that's really funny so talk about so what are some of the things that you guys um that you do in the in the work like what was um you travel right so you travel abroad and do these trainings what is your favorite place that you've been Ooh, nobody's asked me that um 
I mean, I, I'm still blown away um, that I got to go to Iraq last year. Wow. Um, that, yeah, and that still resonates with me. Um, yeah, we, there's a longstanding program um, that is in Erbil, which is in the northern part of Iraq, uh, in Kurdistan. Um, and uh, it, historically, it's been one of the more stable, you know, in Iraqi context, kind of stable areas. Um, the Kurds have always been um, uh, very American, um, uh, positive relationships with them, um, to, to their credit, because man, can we be flaky to them? Uh, God bless them. <laughs> but there is a, um, uh, the Iraqi Institute is up there and, um, not just, um, American, uh, cultural professionals, but other international cultural professionals have cycled through that Institute sharing, um, you know, proper museum, uh, collections management trainings and stuff like that because Iraq was so cut off for so long under Saddam a lot of um, evolution in you know museum in the museum trade um, kind of passed them by so when students are graduating from Iraqi universities um, again kind of similar to what I was you know they're very well versed in the subject matter expertise, but they don't know how to put a collections management plan together, or they don't know how to do a damage assessment of a um, object. So these courses um, are offered routinely there up at this institute in Erbil. And last year I got to go and be a part of the teaching team for a workshop on huh, disaster preparedness because poor country can't get a break. <laughs> so, um, so I was there for about two weeks and um, just, yeah, phenomenal. Um, ate a lot of, um, uh, not, not, pita bread, that's it. Ate a lot of pita bread. Uh, yeah, what are the other things? Um, yeah, lamb meatballs, oh, so good. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to make those the other day and like could not find anything at the grocery store. Oh no, really? Oh. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it was just a um I think it was a COVID supply chain thing, but mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Anywho, but yeah, lamb meatballs are delicious. Oh, so lamb good. It generally is like my favorite. Mhm. Mm anyway. Um so um so you you have props I do. I do. <laughs> so, uh, yes, true. I, uh, segueing from my international work, we also do public outreach to, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. American citizen, um, because, um, disasters happen here too. And I know that we are basically in one right now. Um, but we do, uh, public workshops, for people who have experienced like, you know, your run of the mill disaster, tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding. And again, you know, we understand that, you know, once you make sure that your, you know, you yourself are safe, your family is safe, you have a roof over your head and you have food, you know, your natural next inclination is to, you know, hold on to the stuff that's precious to you, you know, your family photos, your, you know, as like you are demonstrating heritage, actually, Bethany, like cooking is, yeah. you know, a, a universal human um, a form of heritage. Um, so people, you know, people save the tangible outputs of that. They save their recipe books. Um, they save their grandmother's cards. They, um, you know, they want access to ingredients that you know, allow them to create those smells, those environment that remind them of, of uh, good memories and family. So, um, so we get that. Uh, and we host workshops showing how you can use uh, local, um, uh, locally available supplies to uh, salvage, that's the uh, official term that we use, um, any damaged heirlooms that you have. Um, and let's see what all right, we're gonna see if I can like prop the laptop up a little bit. 
do this. So, all right. My left, okay, maybe I need to get out. <laughs> I did this once on our own. Yeah, and if people want to, um, want to see me in my fabulous demo, um, fabulousness um here I'll, I'll come clean i work for the smithsonian cultural rescue initiative and if you go to our youtube channel uh one of these uh, uh public workshops has been posted uh because we did one of these um save your family treasures workshops online uh in order to get sent out to residents that have been dealing with tornadoes and flooding in the southeast right now so I mean, not the tornadoes, but the, the video that is. Available. Yeah, trying to help. Yeah. So, um, so, okay, what do I want to talk about? So, okay. So, Bethany, would you like to know what to do when your framed family photo uh, gets wet? I definitely want to know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so okay we all are yes if you want to look at these very sad children in their halloween costumes um <laughs> is that you no no oh. so we use like stuff that we find in yard sales for our demos so i i wonder oh, if right, you have to get it wet and you don't want to get your own thing wet all the time exactly they they are given noble deaths um for training purposes um but it is funny that like the more and more we do these workshops, I'm waiting for somebody to like contact us and be like, wait. <laughs> that's my um, photo. Exactly. That's my bee costume. <laughs> that's my rainbow costume. From <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and I specifically got rid of that photograph of how, you know, embarrassing it was. Uh, anyway, okay, so your photo gets wet. What so do you do? Your photo gets wet. Okay, so photos are actually, um, you, can, you can try a lot of things. Like, um, you can either, uh, photos like to stick to things. So when they're in uh, frames like this, um, the biggest issue that we see is that they like to uh, get stuck to the glass. Um, or if they're like in a shoe box and they get wet and then suddenly as you're opening the shoe box, um, they get stuck together like this. And a lot of times people just assume like, ugh, like they, you know, very brokenhearted. They assume that it's a loss and they throw them out. My uh, recommendation to you is try this first <laughs> you can pick up a like aluminum turkey pan that i have here voila <laughs> and you want to get yourself a gallon of distilled water um because again any of this stuff that you try to do um you you don't want to introduce any more impurities or um or uh, uh, minerals that are dissolved in the water. So don't use tap water, see if you can get distilled water. And you can put a little bit of uh, distilled water in your tray and you can actually then soak your stuck together photos in the tray. And what's great is that you can actually leave them there. Leave them there, let them soak. You're not gonna make them any more damaged um, than they already are. Um, and if anything, while they're soaking, hopefully some of that gunk that's on them um, will also be released. And when you come back to them and check on them, you can actually slowly see if they will come apart because the emulsion on top of them um, will become a little bit more uh, bendable and they might release. And then once they release, you can hang them up on a clothesline. You can just let them air dry and you will hopefully have salvaged, you know, photos that mean a lot to you um, rather than having to uh, throw them out. So that's one thing. Um, if you ha find out that your framed photo is uh, wet, you want to really break it down into its individual components. So you want to, you know, slide the backing board off, you know, get rid of that, take off, you know, any um, cardboard and stuff like that that's uh, in there as well. And then you want to, you know, carefully remove the photo, you know, on the glass. Now, 
you want to first, before you try um, anything with the water, you want to first see if you can just get it off yourself either, you know, and you want to work on a nice clean space. Um, I'm also handling this without any gloves on. That's bad. You should always wear your nitrile gloves. <laughs> this is very much the like MacGyver version of my, um, it's all good. It's all yeah. good. Um, <laughs> so you want to protect yourself. So, you know, while you're wearing your gloves, see if you can slowly peel the photo off of the glass. You can try to see if, um, putting a little bit of water on it will make it, um, unstick. But if you're not getting anywhere and you feel like the, the photo is going to delaminate, stop what you're doing. Um, you want the, you want to put the photo face down. So the, so yeah, face down let it air dry and then actually we recommend um seeing then once it's dry if you can then take this stuck on photograph and get it scanned now before people go that's not saving my photograph critically think about what it is that you're saving what is the important part of this photograph it's the image right right so if you know if you've tried everything else to um save the actual object let's get down to what is actually important about this object and it's the image so scanning it and reproducing it will still capture that important image that you're trying to save rather than you stressing out about trying to save the original photograph so yeah absolutely mm -hmm. very cool thank you mm -hmm. well, thank you mm -hmm. Um, moving on, the other thing I wanted to just mention is um, books, because uh, everybody, I mean, come on, it's DC. We all got books. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes, a lot of books. <laughs> so, you can definitely try to save books, um, but just a full caveat is that they take forever to dry. And then the other thing that you have to worry about with uh, not fully dry books is mold. Mold loves to eat books. So if you are trying to salvage books, you know, make sure that you're being critical. If it's just easier to buy a new copy of it, I recommend you doing that. But if, but now we're talking about like irreplaceable books, then you can try a couple of these. Um, <laughs> Is that water or oil or what? It was uh, lemon juice. I'm making like a uh -huh. lemony brown butter thing to put with the gnocchi. Uh -huh. That sounds delicious to me right now. It does. It's got mm -hmm. some thyme, it's got some lemon, and it's got brown butter. And I feel like that's done. So cool. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, so sorry, so books. So one thing that you can do with, you know, your, your first editions, your passed down um, books, is that you can freeze them, actually. Huh. Um, and you can freeze them, and that doesn't necessarily dry them, but it just buys you time to figure out how you're going to dry them out, because mold can start growing in like 48 hours. Wow, so, okay if you throw the books in the freezer, that they can live in the freezer for weeks, months even. Okay. And then you can decide, because again, when you're dealing with a disaster, if you're cleaning out a flooded basement, you know. Right. You, you don't wanna take the time to do all the things. Precisely. Right. So if you wanna buy yourself some time and you're not ready to throw out this book, you can freeze it. And yes, I have my fabulous freezer paper here. Hello. <laughs> And you want to make sure you use freezer paper. Don't use freezer bags. Don't use parchment paper. Don't use wax paper. It has to be freezer paper because it's made to live in the freezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you wrap it, um, like I have my lovely little book here. You wrap it like you would um, a present. You know, make sure that you get a nice uh, crisp seal along the edges. And then, um, you want to seal it with this exterior blue tape, which is available at any um, uh, hardware store. Um, 
because again, it's a lot more durable and is, uh, can survive up in a freezer without like coming apart uh, for much longer than your normal masking tape and uh, uh, like scotch tape. So, um, so yeah, once you've got it all nice and wrapped, you can just throw it in your freezer and I'm probably using a trademark phrase, but you can set it and forget it. <laughs> nice. Sweet. And so wait, so did you explain what the ways are after you've frozen the book to- Oh, no, uh, no, I have not. Um, so then, so as time passes, hopefully you've successfully cleaned up everything, you are safe, you have your, you know, you, you have your house back over, um, or your, your head, oh my God. Friday COVID brain. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was, oh, actually, that's the other thing I wanted to do. I was going to make myself a margarita with. Uh, <gasps> give me just a minute. Actually, and I'm going to pause this. Okay. 